why it's not let me, but yeah, I'm going to plug it on plug it back in. If you want to, we can get started if you want while you're figuring that out. Do you want to? Um, yeah, absolutely. Get us going and then we can um, go from there. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I want to just see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, sorry everyone's just looking at my name, but um, good morning. Very exciting. I know we're kind of closing out the semester, so I hope finals are going well and everything. Um, obviously, this is a special meeting, so I appreciate everyone, you know, finding time in their schedule and everything to make. And if, you know, someone's, if you're sitting for someone else, appreciate that as well. Um, no. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, we do have to, we still have to do attendance um, as per usual, right, Angela, even if it's a special meeting? With a special meeting? We do, um, but um, I can go ahead and, and do that while we let our guests get started based on yeah. the attendance, if that works. Sure, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I would, I was going to ask, I don't know if um, Ben and everyone that is um, coming today to present, if you could do another introduction. I know you've done many, many introductions, but just so, you know, everyone's on the same page, because I don't think we have um, everyone that we usually do anyway. So that would be awesome. But what are the floor is yours. There you go, I'm on camera. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. My name is Ben Barnes. I'm the chief financial officer for the system. Uh, um, and um, so it's my responsibility to work with the six institutions that make up CSCU. And uh, I mean, I have a number of responsibilities, but one of them is to ensure that those six institutions uh, develop uh, uh, appropriate and balanced budgets and submit those to the Board of Regents and and get approved by the Board of Regents each year. Uh, that budget includes not only spending levels, but also um, tuition uh, is sort of reflected in that. The Board of Regents adopts tuition, uh, uh, is required to adopt tuition before we can um, uh, bill students. And, and so they are the ones who ultimately set tuition levels. Um, so I am here to talk about where we are in terms of state support for CSU this year. Uh, and what some of the potential outcomes for that mean in terms of the budget for uh, for the system. Uh, I, I, I want to start by pointing out that we're at a moment of, of significant uncertainty right now. We don't know what the legislature and the governor are going to ultimately sign into law with in, in terms of our of our budget for um, for CSCU uh, that um, uh, keeps me up at night a little bit, uh, although I'm. <laughs> You know, where 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 CSU has has long struggled with uh, a lot of one time funding from the state, that where they you know they they make up at the very end. They come they they've, they've many times come through with additional funding uh, at the end of their legislative session, uh, and we certainly hope that that will happen again. Uh, but the process of having to uh, uh, you know uh, advocate for and not know whether that's coming is. Um, uh, is pretty draining on on all the folks who 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 uh, who rely on that support, whether it's students and faculty, uh, administrators, et cetera. We're all um, a little bit on pins and needles right now, to, uh, trying to see what the the future is going to look like. So I'm just going to walk you through um, a, a, just a minute about the process of the legislature because I appreciate that many folks don't. Um, don't care what the legislature is doing most of the time, good for them. Uh, and I want to just give you a sense of how that's going to play out. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we see our, um, our budget looking like for next year and what sort of the range of possibilities are um, and, uh, and go from there. Uh, I will tell you at the outset that um, uh, some of you may uh, perceive me to be pessimistic or, um, you know, uh, not... Uh, you know, expecting the worst out of this uh, budget process this year. Um, I think that's more a reflection of my, um, uh, you know, when, when, when I don't know the answer, when there's an uncertainty, my professional judgment is to prepare for the worst. Uh, and so we certainly are actively preparing for the worst. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not also fighting for the best outcome and working very hard to see that that's not the case. And um, I, I, I really hope that uh, whatever plans we make to deal with the worst case outcome, uh, we're able to soften those considerably and not have to do those things. 
Um, so I, I, I just encourage you if you if you uh, sense me being pessimistic, uh, that's more uh, uh, that's just uh, the way that I pro professionally deal with uncertainty and not necessarily a uh, uh, a sign that we should all um, you know that I that I have some special insight or inside information I'm not sharing. I really I don't. I wish I did uh, have inside information and knew how it was all going to come out. So the legislative session ends on June seventh. Um, uh, but uh, as a practical matter, uh, the the typically at the end of each legislative session there is a lar there's a budget bill. Uh, well, there are usually three or four bills. Uh, sometimes they're all combined into one: uh, a, a operating budget bill, a capital budget bill, and then what are referred to as implementer bills. Uh, sometimes one, sometimes they're split up, or sometimes they're all together. Sometimes all these things are lumped into one, you know, 800 page monstrosity of a piece of legislation that includes the budget and the capital budget and a whole bunch of uh, budget implementation. When I say implementer bill, that is the bill that makes all the um, adjustments to statute in order to comply with the budget. So, for instance, if the legislature decides to spend, um, you know, an extra, you know, million dollars on a new program, the implementer bill will describe what that program is and add the requirements for that program. Uh, so they, 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 they go hand in hand and, and are supposed to uh, match one another, uh, although there often are problems where they don't. Um, so that's all coming together because of all that amount of legislation that needs to be put together as a practical matter. Um, the real decision making ends around Memorial Day. Uh, typically, uh, in, you know, that there's about a week or 10 days uh, at the end where where bills are being prepared, votes are being marshaled within the legislature. Um, and, uh, you know, while minor adjustments may be made at the very end, by and large, most of the decisions are going to be made uh, in the final days of May uh, and that the June portion of the session is going to be about them going through the process of adopting that. Um, now that's normal. Things could be different. We could get a budget agreement could be announced this afternoon. Uh, actually, I've heard rumors that there that that that, that could happen. Although, you know, the legislature um, uh, probably even more than a college campus is a place where rumors are uh, uh, are the coin of the realm. So there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of idle speculation by people who don't have any real knowledge. Um, so who knows? So we could see action soon. We could see action in a couple of weeks. Uh, sort of at the outside, but but they we're we're entering into the period of time when the decisions will be made about the uh, about the budget. Um, I know you probably uh, I hope you have received encouragement to uh, you know call your legislators and 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 reach out. Uh, now is a good time to do that if you haven't. Um, uh, but a lot of that is um, uh, it has been underway for a few weeks with our bar with the unions that represent the faculty and staff. Uh, through um, the faculty advisory committee, through this group, through the leadership of each institution, we've all been trying to raise our voices in support of more more funding. Uh, right now, so so that's sort of where we are procedurally. We are uh, we're trying to get a a, a budget uh, uh, enacted that will um, support our operations in a way that we uh, that we think is appropriate. The the last budget, so the, the way that the Process works up until now. The governor submitted a budget proposal in in February. Uh, that budget was not particularly good for CSCU. In fact, it was really pretty awful for us. Uh, the governor's um, uh, budget narrative, like the book that he puts out with the budget, where he talks about uh, uh, what, you know all the initiatives that are in there, uh, said that um, the that the amount of money that we requested was unsustainable uh, and would be too much of a burden on taxpayers. And that um, because our enrollment had dropped during the pandemic uh, and had not yet rebounded, which is true, um, we uh, we should be reducing our our expectations for for resources uh, and cutting spending, um, and that uh, the assistance that we'd received from the state at the end of the pandemic uh, and the assistance we'd received from the federal government during the pandemic. Uh, we're all done, and we should not count on those one-time sources continuing. So they gave us, whereas in, in the current year, we're getting about $150 million of extra money uh, from the state government to help um, offset the loss of pandemic uh, enrollment and funding. 
Uh, they, the governor proposed that 150 or so uh, be reduced to 100 million in the first year of the biennium and then to 50 million in the second year. Um, I know these numbers are hard to understand, like what is 100 million? Is that a lot of money or not? Um, in an organization our size, 100 million is a lot of money. Um, our total budget is about 1.2 billion dollars. The community college system is about six or 700 million. The universities is, well, it's probably we're more like 1.4 billion. Uh, but this is potentially the cuts that we're talking about are, 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 are I mean, it's not half of our of our resources, but it's, um, you know, approaching, you know, seven or eight percent of our total resources for the system. So it's it's a major uh, a major um, uh, uh, amount of money that we're talking about uh, losing under the governor's proposal. A few months later, the Repro appropriations committee, the legislature came out with a, their first budget proposal. And it was better than the governor's budget by about um, 50 million dollars in the first year and about 30 million in the second year, which is all good. Those are that's real money, and it was it's very welcome what the legislature did coming out of the committee. Uh, but it still leaves us pretty well short of where we want to be. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen and walk through what we think the appropriations committee budget, how that leaves us relative to our uh, expected spending next year. Uh, and I apologize in advance for showing tables of numbers, but um, you know I'm the budget guy, and that's that's what we're here to talk about. So uh, you're just going to have to put up with me for a few minutes. I, I'll try to be quick about it. Um, I know that this is we're, we're talking about like late uh, late in the academic year, and you may have um, limited patience for some of this. Uh, but here here we are. Um, this is uh, this is. Hang on, let me go to the top. This is our. Uh, this is the plan that we presented um, uh, publicly a couple of weeks ago and, and remains, I think, a, a, a good description of where we are uh, relative to the appropriations committee budget. So this top section where it says deficit um, shows uh, uh, the top part is, is revenue and it shows for 24 and 25, which is remember that two years is a biennial budget. Uh, so the next year and the following year. Uh, and I've broken down revenue into three categories. The first is state aid that they give us like direct cash. Uh, and they're proposing that their cash contributions to the system would be 552 million in the first year and 488 in the second year. You can see that drop off I described that they propose. Um, we're at like 600 and some million this year. Um, and then there's a, they also support us by paying fringe benefits for some, for many of our employees. Uh, and I've, included our estimates of what those numbers would be um, uh, in the uh, uh, in the second row. And then the third row is, a, I call it operating revenue, but that's tuition and fees. And there's a few other minimal things in there. We, you know, rent a hall out or something like that. But basically that's tuition and fees that we receive from, uh, uh, from students or from third parties on students' behalf. So that includes all the money we receive under the Pell program. You know, if you're a Pell student and the Pell, you know, you get a Pell grant and that and you apply that to your tuition, that goes into our operating revenue. Operating revenue is down. Um, I think it, that those numbers are down uh, uh, probably by as much as uh, 70 to 100 million dollars compared to where we were before the pandemic because of drops in enrollment. Uh, but it's still, I mean, we still have a lot of operating revenue that students and um, students at, at our institutions uh, shell out quite a lot of money to attend uh, and get their education. And I am very cognizant of that and um, mindful of how important it is that we are uh, uh, providing a service for which students pay uh, a lot of funds. Um, and you can see that's here. So we think our revenue is gonna be about 1.4 billion in the first year and one point, a little under 1.4 billion in the second year, largely because of that drop off in uh, in state aid in the in the proposal and offset by a little bit of increase in in uh, operating revenue. Now, look, I will tell you, I hope operating revenue outperforms these numbers. We are conservative in estimating how much tuition we will receive in the future. Uh, Carrie's here from the community colleges. I know they are. We had this discussion yesterday. Uh, I've also talked through the projections with all the university uh, financial staff and. Uh, because the recovery of enrollment from the pandemic has been so hard to predict and, uh, um, you know, uh, up and down, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to know how um, higher education institutions will recover enrollment. We, we're being conservative uh, in our projections of enrollment, uh, but we do show a little bit of uh, improvement in the second year of the biennium. Now, this, this line here, total expenditures, 
uh, on a current services basis is is uh, uh, I think this is uh, this is where this is where the rub is. So we believe that um, uh, in order for us to operate our six institutions in, this, in in approximately the same manner that we do now, with a similar level of uh, course offerings, uh, not laying off any of our staff, continuing to provide student support services, advisement, counseling, athletics, uh, academic programs, essentially as we are now, uh, with you know normal uh, adjustment that, that that occurs every year. Uh, will cost us about 1.5 to 1 billion 522 million dollars in the first year and about 1 billion 586 million in the second year. The reason it goes up in the second year is because we've built in raises for our faculty and staff. We don't know that those will happen because we, we have a contract contracts in place for fiscal 24. We don't have contracts in place for fiscal 25. Uh, or well, we we don't have wages. The contracts are, are there, but they we still have to renegotiate wages for fiscal 25. Uh, but we've assumed that there will be raises offered uh, that are. Um, oh, did you see? There's a note there, Angelo, about teams. Sorry, it popped up on my screen. Um, the um, if um, uh, so. Um, we built in a more conservative assumption in order to make sure we understand what our potential shortfall. And so this projected balance, which is negative 109 million in the first year and negative 225 in the second year, that's our those are our deficits that we're projecting based on the revenues that are in the appropriations committee budget and current services spending levels going forward to next year. Um, I you know I present these numbers to you with with humility. These are projections of the future, and we don't know. Uh, you know, we don't know how many faculty members will retire. We don't know how many students will enroll. We don't know, um, you know, whether or not we will have other financial impacts that we haven't, we can't foresee. You know, impacts on our, you know, boilers blow up and we need to replace them, or uh, you know, changes to our with our relationships with our vendors will. You know they will demand higher prices because of inflation. There's a lot that we don't don't know, but um, I will tell you that these projections I think are uh, are uh, honestly developed uh, with uh, a significant amount of detailed work at each campus, uh, reviewing rosters of employees and faculty, reviewing uh, long-term uh, uh, en enrollment trends, et cetera. So. Uh, I have as much confidence as any uh, projection of prediction of the future uh, in, can be uh, in these numbers. So 109 and 225, these are big deficits. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but um, uh, uh, seven or eight years ago, when the students first plan to consolidate the community colleges was first conceived in 2017 uh, uh, by the Board of, uh, of Regents at that time, the plan for that merger was to save $25 million. So, uh, and, and I will tell you, there has been a lot of uh, uh, hand wringing and, and, and uh, um, consternation and upset by faculty and some students and others uh, and community members about the merger of the community colleges, uh, which was intended to save $25 million. I believe it's actually saved more than that. Uh, the savings from the merger have been more like 30 or 40 million. Uh, uh, as, as, as I've been able, or as Carrie has been able to quantify and share the numbers with me. Um, so that, uh, uh, just to put it in scale, like the, the level of uh, change to the system that would be required to achieve these levels of savings is uh, quite large. Um, and so even something as major as merging the community colleges would not uh, begin to approach the kinds of savings necessary to close this gap. Um, so we developed um, a mitigation plan, and I want to put this in, in a little bit of context for you all, uh, because I, um, you know, I'm, I am, uh, well, I wanted to sort of explain the, why we came up with this and how you all should view it, uh, in my opinion. So, um, obviously, this was presented to the legislature in the last weeks of last week of April. Uh, um, you know, we had a press conference, many students showed up. Some of you on this call were there uh, and uh, uh, spoke eloquently about the value of our system and the institutions uh, that serve you. Um, thank you for that. The, uh, but the intention of, of developing a mitigation plan 
was because we felt that it was critical as a state entity, as a state agency, for us to communicate uh, clearly and directly to the legislature and the governor the impacts that we foresee should the budget that is, has been proposed be enacted. Uh, because it's complicated, it's very difficult to know whether, uh, you know, a particular package of appropriations, um, you know, what would be the consequences of that? Uh, and because um, in, the, in this case, the numbers actually went up a little bit, and some of the numbers, not all of them, but there were some increases uh, within the proposed budget uh, and other decreases. Um, we wanted to make, make it clear that the increases that were there were not sufficient to cover growing uh, wage uh, costs for our employees and to, um, and to support, um, uh, and, and that we did not have, uh, because of our drop in, in uh, revenue from tuition fees related to enrollment, we were not able to use uh, student-based funding to, to make up the shortfall. So in order to truly communicate that to the board, we or to the legislature, we felt that it was appropriate to present a, a deficit mitigation plan. What we would do if that budget was enacted in order to close the deficit so they could understand the consequences of their actions and I frankly hope reconsider those actions. We wanted the legislature to say, oh no, we didn't intend to pass a budget that would do those things and we would like to find more money so you don't have to. Like I'm, I'm very uh, direct and clear with you all. This was in order, the purpose of this was twofold. The most important reason was to try to convince the legislature that the actions they were considering were um, were not in the best interests of the state and of their constituents and to get them to do something different. So that's one piece. The second piece was to begin the process of planning for the worst, because as I said, as a, you know, I, my job is to take care of other people's money, your, your money and state taxpayers money and make sure that that is used responsibly to, to run our system. And so when I am concerned about not having enough, it, it's my, my job is to make sure that we are taking steps to plan for uh, our response um, and, and to be able to do that in a responsible way. If the state gives us less money and we, we only have the authority to spend what we have. Uh, and so if we think we're gonna see a cut, uh, we, need to be, we need to immediately begin planning for that. So this mitigation plan reflects sort of a first draft of those plans and also a communication to the legislature. The plans that we include, I'm gonna walk through the, the mitigation steps that we identified so you can have a sense of the scale of the, of the, of the problem. I will tell you though that the, the, the universities and the community college are all continuing to refine these numbers, both what their spending is gonna be on a current services basis uh, and also what exact kinds of mitigation steps they might take uh, in order to, to, to move forward. This mitigation plan included some sort of general categories. There were some, you know, some of the universities said, well, you know, we're not sure exactly we, we would achieve some savings through reducing um, part-time lecturers by, um, by reducing the number of sections that are offered as an example. But none of them had gone through the process of identifying which sections might be reduced or which academic departments might be impacted by those by those changes. That's a process that is beginning now and would uh, certainly kick into gear uh, over the summer if necessary. But we, so we have sort of a, a general, some of these options were, were relatively general. That's why we rolled them all up together and don't describe them each individually, because frankly, uh, we need a little, we need more time to, uh, to, uh, to, to make sure that we're right. Uh, but I think in general, these are a fair reflection of the kinds of decisions we would need to make uh, and that we are preparing to make if necessary. Um, so first are revenue options. These are things we could do to generate more money. And the first of these is tuition increases. I don't say the first because that's the first place we go. In fact, in many respects, it's the last place we would go. Uh, but it is, um, you know, it is sort of typical budget form to put the revenues at the top and the expenditures below. And so I follow that, that, that pattern here. And tuition is by far the, the revenue that we're able to adjust most uh, directly and produce the most revenue from. Uh, this tuition increase that we have in our mitigation plan includes a 5% tuition increase at the community colleges for next fall. Uh, there's already a 3% tuition and fee increase for the universities in place for next fall compared to the current academic year. 
we we would not propose changing that because of the time it's too late in the in the in the registration cycle at the universities uh, for us to be able to fairly impose additional tuition and fees. Uh, but the colleges, because they tend to have registration occurs much later, uh, and and the vast majority of students haven't paid for their tuition for the fall. Um, uh, at this point, we uh, believe that we could still implement a tuition increase uh, for the community colleges if necessary. The tuition increases at the community colleges don't generate a lot of money. They generate less than a million dollars for each percent increase in tuition and fees. So you can see 3.9 million dollars would be a 5% tuition increase at the community colleges. In the second year, we proposed, well, not proposed, we we uh, identified as a potential option if necessary that um, the entire system could increase tuition by 5%, which would generate about 31 million dollars. Uh, there are also some enrollment initiatives that individual institutions suggested. These are things where they. Um, uh, you know, uh, new academic programs that the, some of the universities were uh, have, you know, in that they're working on that they think they could push push out into the marketplace and that, that would generate new enrollment uh, by, you know, offering a new graduate program or a new online program or something that they think would would be attractive to new students and would drive some enrollment. Uh, they they we've included the projections for that for those uh, in that second row. The other column. Um, those are a couple things. One is um, uh, uh, interest rates are much higher. So we do actually have some cash that we invest in. You know, we have a little bit of operating money that we keep in the bank. Uh, and so we get a little bit of interest from that. So that's one item that interest in, is improving. So we think we could, we could uh, uh, gain a little interest income. It's negative in the second year because um, uh, some of the program cuts that were proposed uh, would um, result in reduced uh, revenue, and so we've added that in as an offset there. You can see the, those revenue options are not very large. I mean, even a 5% tuition increase every year raises $30 million. Um, that's a lot of money, uh, but compared to a $100 million deficit, it's not a lot. I mean, it's not enough. Um, tuition increases would have to be in order to solve a hundred million dollar problem through tuition increases. You would have to raise tuition uh, uh, very, very profoundly uh, in ways that I believe would impact your alls and your fellow students' ability to afford us, uh, and would depress enrollment, therefore undermining the whole value of trying to raise revenue through um, through tuition increases. You know, I have no idea whether a 5% tuition increase would um, uh, a dramatic, I, I should say this, I know that even a 5% tuition increase will reduce um, demand for uh, our, for, would redu reduce enrollment. Uh, I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity yet to take uh, uh, introduction to microeconomics, uh, a course that I uh, took as an undergraduate. Uh, uh, and then another version of it as a graduate student. And uh, they were very clear in that class that when price goes up, demand goes down. Um, and even in higher education, that is true. So we're very reluctant. I, I'm, I'm very interested in feedback from you about whether a 5% tuition increase is, is something that you would see as uh, a tolerable or not, uh, and whether that is preferable to deeper cuts uh, uh, in the institutions uh, those are difficult decisions that the that the Board of Regents is ultimately going to have to make, and I'm sure they would welcome uh, contributions and ideas from you all about that. Um, expenditure options, things that we could do to cut spending. Uh, the first is eliminating unfilled vacancies. So those are it's essentially attrition. There are a lot of vacant positions that uh, that we have a lot of employees, fourteen thousand employees. So by um, uh, not filling vacant positions that exist now and not filling vacant positions that that, that uh, occur during the year, we can save quite a bit of money. Uh, and this is an estimate of what we think that attrition could could be. Um, uh, this wouldn't be an, a, a hard hiring freeze. There's some positions that we need to have. Um, you know, we we need to have uh, uh, certain students facing service. You know, people who. Uh, serve students. We need to make sure that there are, you know, somebody in the front of every classroom that we've scheduled, uh, you know, who's qualified and doing a good job teaching. So there are certain things we need to hire, and we would prioritize those. But there are, uh, we, we think we could probably leave, uh, you know, we could achieve these savings through leaving position vacant. 
Uh, we've also built in layoffs, which are extremely difficult to do in higher education. We have a unionized workforce. The layoffs are, uh, you know, in any circumstances are, are disruptive to the organization, extremely disruptive to the individuals who are impacted by them uh, and by the people who are, um, uh, who are left in the organization. Uh, it's, there are a lot of reasons why layoffs are uh, an unattractive option, but they might be necessary. The reason that you see big savings in the second year, not the first, is because, again, our collective bargaining agreements require long notice, uh, and also because uh, the mission and the work that we do uh, often requires long notice, that we have teach-out requirements. We can't lay off uh, faculty who have teaching loads that are necessary to be carried out. So um, it takes a fairly long time to adjust the uh, expectations and schedules so that we could uh, achieve those savings. Um, in addition, we have uh, savings from reducing part-time and adjunct staff. This is something that, um, you know, essentially, uh, I'm sure some of you have from time to time encountered a class that was initially scheduled, but then was canceled because of low enrollment. Um, that happens in any institution. Um, uh, uh, on a normally, uh, but if the, the, the tolerance for low enrolled classes is, is adjusted, uh, and you make, uh, more affirmative efforts to consolidate sections, uh, and ensure that classes are fully enrolled, which means larger classes for students. Um, we can reduce the number of part-time and adjunct faculty that we, uh, employ, um, at the colleges and universities, uh, and the savings that we project are shown here about $40 million a year. Uh, and then there are other reductions. These are specific programs that we would get out of that we would stop doing both academic programs and student support programs. Um, you know, things that we do that are a little outside of our mission, uh, workforce training programs that are losing money, um, uh, other specific items that we think are maybe a little outside of our core mission that we could stop doing. But I say that knowing that just because they're outside of our core mission doesn't mean that they're not important to uh, to um, members of our community. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll put out there one of the things that's been you know uh, we've looked at the the, the value of is uh, uh, campus daycare. We provide daycare on a number of our campuses. It's very expensive. We lose a lot of money on that, um, uh, and um, uh, and yet to the, the the students and faculty who, and staff who rely on that daycare, it's it's a it's very critical uh, and it's part of part of the work that we do that we would love to continue to do because it's um, it's important to the state of Connecticut and it's important to our community. Uh, but is it as is it as important as uh, our instruction of students? No, uh, that's our core mission. Uh, and so, you know, elimination of that is the, an example of the kinds of other reductions that we uh, had identified. All told, those those changes that you see uh, would. Um, Reduce our deficit down to 7 and 20 million dollars. Um, obviously, uh, we, you know, th this is not a precise science. So that, you know, that that struck me as a as an appropriate deficit mitigation plan. I'm hoping that we will see uh, improvement in the budget that is at least as big as those remaining deficits and, and hopefully much larger. Um, and so that we don't have to uh, carry out all these these steps. If we did have to carry those out, and I'm just putting this out here because I want to be transparent about what we put on the table. If we did end up um, uh, carrying out those plans, uh, we estimated the amount of the number of layoffs uh, uh, of full time and part time uh, faculty and staff that would need to happen in order to carry out those options listed above. Uh, it's about um, 650 cumulative uh, full time layoffs and about uh, just under 3,000 uh, part-time positions that would be eliminated, uh, uh, faculty and staff. Now, remember, we have 14,000 employees. We have about 4,000 full-time employees and about nine or 10,000 part-time employees uh, at our in our system today. So we're very large, uh, and so these numbers are, um, uh, you know, should be taken in context. But even in the context of 4,000 employees. To lay off 650 of them uh, is 15 percent, uh, and is a significant um, would would entail a significant uh, uh, disruption to our organization, uh, and obviously disruption to the lives of the uh, of the individuals who are impacted. 
Uh, and obviously they are doing work now to serve students. They're teaching classes, they're, um, you know, administering, um, you know, student support services, back office functions that are necessary. Uh, and so the loss of those folks would diminish the services that you get uh, and, and would um, uh, certainly make it, you know, there'll be fewer courses and more uh, time involved with receiving any service from, from the institutions that you attend. So, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen enough of the depressing table. Um, I, uh, again, so right now we're hoping that the legislature will significantly increase the, le the, the proposed, uh, funding levels. Uh, I have reason to believe that they are that they, I mean, the, the, the leadership in both the house and Senate. Uh, are supportive of increasing funding to us. Uh, they are also, however, supportive of increasing funding to other groups. Uh, you know, the nursing home workers, the um, the home care workers, the uh, group homes uh, that serve the developmentally disabled, um, K-12 school districts. These are all groups that uh, uh, that have raised the issue of needing more money than was in the budget. Uh, and uh, have significant impact. You know, these, these are all big, big ticket items in the state budget, uh, and we're not the only one out there. So I, I am, you know, I want to make it clear that it's not, it's not that their budget was perfect, except that it was a hundred million dollars short for CSCU. Uh, it was a hundred million dollars short for a lot of folks, uh, and a lot of them are out there asking for the money, and 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 we are too. Uh, I'm, I think we make a better case than some of them, uh, and I think that uh, uh, we. Um, we uh, uh, certainly are, are are well regarded by the legislature, who understands the value of what we do for you, um, and um, they want to they want to fix this. They may not be able to because they need to. Um, there there are some they you know any time there's a budget act, it's you know remember that how does a bill become a law? Little video, I'm sure. I hope some of you have seen it. Uh, I, I saw it years ago. Uh, the governor has to sign this thing at the end of the day. The legislature passes a bill and then it goes to the governor's desk and he has to sign it. Practically, what that means is that the legislature must negotiate the final budget with the governor so that they all have agreement. I mean, they don't, uh, the, the, they do not have super majorities in both chambers. Uh, uh, well, they might be able to generate a super majority, but in order to pass a budget without the governor, they need 60% of each chamber to vote uh, for the budget uh, to, to to have what they call a veto proof majority um, that uh, the Democratic caucuses, which are the majority in both chambers, I, I think are technically large enough to produce a supermajority in the Senate, but not likely in the House. And when you consider that the Democratic caucus includes a number of more centrist members in both chambers, uh, who would be unlikely to override a governor's veto uh, on a budget um, like this? It, it, it's um, uh, it, it's pretty. It's, it seems inevitable that the final product will be the outcome of negotiations between the governor and the legislature. Moreover, the legislature adopted early this session an extension of what they call the guardrails, and this is a series of legal provisions that restrict how much money the state can spend each year. There's a spending cap, uh, there, there's a, a appropriations cap, there's something called a volatility cap. There's a whole series of protect provisions that either divert revenue into reserves or into paying for unfunded liabilities or restrict the amount of money that the legislature can appropriate each year. Uh, there is a little bit of room left for them to appropriate, uh, and that got a little bit better uh, because revenues seem to be getting better. So they have a little bit of room under that cap, uh, but not enough to meet all the needs of the budget. So they are uh, either going to have to make decisions about which items get funded within the spending cap, or they're going to have to agree on some kind of um, strategy to work around the spending cap. Um, there, are, you know, there's a long history uh, that I can attest to of the legislature finding ways to spend a little bit more than the rules normally would allow them to do. They could do that by, you know, doing revenue diversions where they set aside certain revenues and directly pay for certain activities. They can, um, uh, well, I don't need to go into the technical details. There are a number of different approaches that they could take, but they would need to have agreement from the governor to do that. 
the governor has been reluctant to make, I mean, I have not heard him make any public statements that suggest he is willing to do any of those things, which is discouraging. Uh, on the other hand, um, one of my uh, lessons that I've learned about politics over the years is that when when people are uh, 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 compelled to do something that they don't really want to do uh, because of political support, uh, which is what we're hoping will happen with the governor on this particular question, that he will ultimately accept something that he doesn't really want to do uh, because um, because of the, the political pressure to do so. People seldom, you know, you know, they're, they're opposed to something until they change their mind and then they're opposed and then they're in favor of it or what, whatever. You're, you're not going to see too many hints about it. Uh, I think there, there will be a change and he will accept something in negotiations. Uh, uh, and, and we're not likely to see, you know, too much public softening in his language uh, prior to that. So we, we, you know, we're, 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 we're left sort of like the, um, you know, the, uh, the devout Catholics in St. Peter's Square waiting for the smoke to come out of the chimney uh, to indicate that they've picked a new pope. Uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, images for, for the budget process. It, it, there are some people in the room and, and all the rest of us are waiting outside, waiting for them to uh, uh, tell us what they've decided. Now we're, you know, sending messages in the room all the time and calling people and, and working with our legislative uh, uh, supporters to get uh, to make sure that we get a good outcome. Uh, but it, ultimately, it's a it's a negotiation happening uh, by other people in a room that we're not in, uh, and we'll and we'll find out uh, how much uh, how much happens here. Uh, a last thing I'll say um, uh, is uh, we you know once we find out, which may be as late as June seventh, but maybe you know this afternoon or tomorrow, probably not this afternoon. They they tend to not work too hard on uh, uh, you know. On, on beautiful Friday afternoons, but they might, you never know. Uh, I don't believe they're meeting today. I, I kind of keep track of when they're having negotiations. Uh, they, um, but I, it's possible next week or it's possible that a couple weeks down the road, they'll announce something. At that point, um, we've been developing budgets based on this appropriations committee budget. Uh, and we will have to sort of make adjustments one way or the other. Uh, based on what gets finally adopted, uh, and then we will bring that to the um, Board of Regents uh, in a, uh, in the, during the June process. So there's a finance committee meeting on June 21st. There's a full board meeting on June 29th, I believe, uh, that will, um, uh, or maybe the 28th, I can't remember, that will, um, where we will, uh, the board must enact a spending plan for next year. Uh, we don't have the authority to spend money unless the board gives us that authority after June 30th. Uh, so we will certainly do that. We may, um, depending on what happens with the budget, that process may be easier or more difficult. We may end up not fully resolving all of the, the deficit at the, in, in June. We may have to go back for budget revisions as we continue to work, especially if they're deep cuts. Uh, it may take us a little bit more time to um, to work out exactly how to implement those cuts. And so we may end up having to go back to the board again later in the summer uh, to get them to make um, adjustments. The one thing I will say is that if if um, if the cuts are, are significant and it's necessary to raise tuition at the community colleges, uh, I think we would do that in June, uh, just because we need to be able to establish those rates so we can, you know, uh, 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 set up financial aid packages for students and, um, you know, bill the payers, whether it's the PACT program or the, um, uh, uh, you know, individual students and their families or Pell or what have you. So we would need to establish tuition rates uh, in June. Um, right now, there, you know, we have the authority to go forward with no, no increases, uh, but we, we might have to take that action um, in June if there are deep cuts. Um, I, I would not, I'm not, you know, it's quite possible that the legislature, if they give us a lot of money, uh, will require us uh, either formally or informally, which we would honor, uh, not to raise tuition. Uh, the legislature is very much on, on, on your side, I think, on, on the issue of tuition increases and don't want to see us raise tuition. On the other hand, um, you know, we've been paying, you know, the, the state gave us a large rate, well, not that large, but over time, they accumulate and become large numbers. Uh, uh, we have to. We've been paying raises for the last couple of years, and we'll have to pay raises to all of our employees on July one. Those raises cost us uh, 
about $30 million. And so far, the state has been paying for uh, about half of that um, and not the entire cost of those raises. So even just to pay that, we will need to, uh, uh, the, 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 it's, it's very difficult for us to continue to pay our staff without raising tuition every year um, uh, under this current system that the state um, supports us under. So uh, I, I think that there will be, um, it would have, it would require a very generous uh, uh, and somewhat unexpected increase in state assistance uh, for um, for us to be able to agree to a tuition freeze um, uh, anywhere in the system uh, uh, during this upcoming biennium. Uh, but um, it's not out of the question, and we certainly uh, have given the information to the legislature uh, that you see here and, and even a little bit more detail so they know what they would need to give us if they really want us to hold tuition flat. So we, we're, we're hoping for the best. Uh, we're continuing to stay, uh, you know, I, I make my calls every couple of days. I call around to the appropriations chairs and the leadership, and we're making sure that they uh, don't forget about us uh, as they go through this uh, budget negotiation. Um, and you and your uh, colleagues as fellow students and, and faculty and staff have, have also been making calls uh, and sending emails and sending letters, and I appreciate all that. Uh, I think that we're, uh, we're in their mind, and, and we'll just have to see how it plays out. So I'm happy to take any questions about this. I'm sorry to have gone on for 45 minutes. That was a little longer than I intended, but uh, I'd rather have you know the details um, so that you can uh, uh, understand what we're trying to do. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I was going to say um, thank you so much, Ben, because um, I know it's a lot, but it's all important information. Um, but yeah, any any questions? I can't see everyone, by the way. I don't know why it's only showing me like six people. So if your hands up, you can just unmute and go for it. Uh, um, I have a question on Venetia from Middlesex Community College. Um, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Barnes. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, how do scholarships, how would scholarships work? You know, private scholarships that each campus gets for students. Like how you know would they be combined as a whole, or how would that work? Do you know? Well, there are a number of different categories of financial aid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'll start with the community college context. Um, in the community colleges, um, you know, we establish tuition and then we apply. So every student, if you're a full-time student, it's I think forty-eight hundred is the tuition for a full year in the community colleges, more or less. Right now, uh, Carrie will correct me if I'm wrong about that. My recollection off the top of my head, um, but if there it's is a little a, bit lower, um, it's a little bit lower. Currently, okay. it's forty one seventy six for full time students with fees of five twenty four. So it's about forty seven hundred with fees. Okay, so forty so forty seven hundred is the current tuition and, and 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 fees, and we charge every student that amount. But then we apply financial aid from various sources against that. So if you're if you get a full Pell Grant, the Pell Grant is actually larger than that. So you would fully cover your tuition and fees and get a little bit of cash back that you could use to pay for books and transportation and the like. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if you get a PAC grant, if you're a full time student and you're PAC eligible, uh, you the the state funds would then be brought to bear to cover your tuition and fees. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've gotten a private scholarship from you know the local. Uh, you know, a local uh, civic organization or, um, you know, a, a, your family's employer. I mean, there are a number of private groups that provide scholarships. Those would be applied. Uh, the, the, you know, obviously, if tuition is higher, it would be, um, you know, the relative value of that financial aid might be might be reduced, uh, but you would still get those funds. We also um, have something called institutional aid, which I think may be what you were referring to. So we have a policy at the Board of Regents that uh, a minimum of 15% of every tuition dollar uh, that we raise is set aside for what we call institutional aid. Mm -hmm. And that is packaged typically based on um, you know, financial need mm -hmm. uh, and given to students uh, to help them afford school. So the uh, all those sources of financial aid would continue to be in place, but in some cases, because as the tuition increases, you know, for instance, if you're a Pell student right now, you would get back, 
I don't know, I think it's about a thousand dollars because the Pell Grant is about a thousand dollars higher than our tuition and fees. So you would get that money back uh, for uh, to cover other cost of attendance. If the tuition and fees go up, the amount of money you get back will be lower. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, with the PAC program, um, uh, you uh, uh, well with PAC, it's actually based on full tuition, so PAC would be uh, it wouldn't really make any difference. Um, but again, all of these things, the higher the tuition and fees, uh, the more likely that you would have some uh, out of pocket costs or those out of pocket costs that you have would would grow uh, uh, at the universities. There's a lot great. There's much more out of pocket costs. Most students at the universities end up paying more uh, either through loans or, you know, money that you've earned or money that your family is able to contribute. Uh, so um, as tuition rises. Uh, typically, the out of pocket costs are going to go up uh, in, in a commensurate way. So, if you have a package from Southern that provides you where you end up having to pay or borrow uh, $8,000 a year uh, for tuition and fees, um, that number would probably rise because uh, the increases in overall tuition and fees would um, uh, would not would, would be would not be offset uh, fully by increases in financial aid uh, because some of those financial aid sources are fixed. Yeah, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anisha, I, 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 hope I was actually curious about how the consolidation would affect uh, such grants, but then, yes, I sort of get the point. Thank you. Louis, please had your hand up. Yeah, hey, everyone. Um, I was just wondering, um, do we know like uh, what faculty exactly are potentially, if the budget doesn't get approved, uh, are going to be laid off? And um, yeah, I, I was just wondering, like, where, where those cuts are going to be made, and um, or do we have a rough estimate of, uh, you know, which schools those faculty are going to be affecting? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know, in, like individuals, there's a whole process. Well, we have three co collective bargaining agreements that cover faculty and, a, and several that affect um, staff. Each of those is a little bit different and there are, there are very specific requirements for how to go about identifying uh, faculty and staff uh, for layoff in the event that that's necessary. Uh, and we would go through that process uh, and that process has opportunities for us to identify alternatives and for us to negotiate uh, uh, resolutions and to find ways to avoid layoffs. Obviously, we, we're going to follow that. We don't want to lay people off. So, so we, we, that process would have to occur and that would produce the outcome of its specifics. In terms of which institutions these are going to affect, um, the majority of the deficit in the first year is at the community colleges. Uh, you know, I'm just being, you know, I, 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 we're, we're, we're still working on our budget and we're hoping to resolve that. And I know Carrie and I have spent a lot of time talking and, and reviewing the information at the community colleges. Uh, they're working very hard to find ways to diminish, to reduce that, that shortfall uh, that don't harm students. Uh, but there clearly would be a significant impact on students at the community college. I mean, on, on faculty and staffing levels at the community colleges. Uh, they also, um, you would probably, because of the way that their collective bargaining agreements work and because they rely much more heavily on part time faculty at the community colleges, there would probably be more impacts right away at the, at the universities. The. You know, they have a long, long notice periods and they use they their reliance on, um, you know, only about 20% of sections are taught by uh, adjuncts in the, um, uh, at the at the universities. And that number is 50 or 60% at the colleges. So, and because obviously uh, the contract, well, obviously it may not be obvious to you, but uh, it is, it, it is a fact of our contracts that we need to reduce part-time uh, and, and adjunct faculty before we would uh, lay off full-time faculty. So if we eliminated the department of, um, you know, the, you know, whatever it is, the English department, I'm not proposing we would do that, but if we eliminated an academic department at an inst at a community college, 
uh, we would first obviously have to eliminate the adjunct faculty um, and then retain the full time faculty uh, to the extent that we still had you know courses we were offering that needed to be covered. So I think you would end up seeing significant reductions in adjunct faculty uh, across the system, but that is going to impact the community colleges to a greater degree. Uh, the um, uh, but then again, you know, we don't really know what the final numbers are going to look like. So that's a that's a little speculative, but I think that there's a little bit more concern uh, for um, imminent staff reductions there in, in, a, in a bad budget outcome. Yes, Donna, I see you have your hand up. Donna, you're still muted. Well, Donna's been muting Ben. Um, there's a question in the chat about generating additional cost saving ideas that can be explored. I don't know if you have any suggestions on those, Carrie or Ben, or, or if that's a possibility. We are, I am, yes, we are absolutely looking at cost saving ideas. Uh, I am, you know, there are, there are a whole ton of ideas that have come out of the, uh, you know, some of them, you know, fully cooked and some of them, you know, not ready for prime time. Uh, that we've that have been raised by the uh, the staff at each institution. So we are we are casting a wide net. Um, if you have particular, I mean, the idea that that came up in the chat of having uh, staff work from home two or three days a work a week during the summer, uh, that actually I had that discussion with um, uh, uh, with my facilities director uh, two days ago um, about the you know we did an evaluation of what would what. If if we closed uh, the community college campuses on on um, uh, on Fridays, many of the community colleges do significantly reduce hours during the summer uh, when they're you know between sessions and when they're when there's limited use of the buildings, uh, uh, and and there's been talk about expanding that, and there are real savings to be achieved. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings from, you know, from not air conditioning the buildings and from reducing security guards and some other things. It's not as large as as we would, you know, as, it's not large enough to solve the problem, but it is a, a real contributor. I'm a little hesitant, uh, you know, when we're trying to also grow enrollment and trying to serve students as well as we can. Um, I'm, you know, there, there are downsides to that. Uh, you know, being open and convenient and having hours that work with your schedules, you know, that's that's important to us. And so we're we're you know, we'd have to balance the the potential impact of that. So, for instance, you know, only having the community college campuses be open 3 days a week during the fall and spring semesters would be pretty awful uh, in terms of uh, uh, our ability to serve students. And, and I don't think it would be worth it. But you're the, during the summer. Uh, I think that makes uh, uh, that makes a big um, uh, that that's a very valid uh, suggestion. And we've looked at a whole bunch of other things, changing how we you know pro procure different goods and services that we need, uh, changing how we do scheduling. Uh, there are a lot of of, uh, of of ideas out there that are being you know raised and then evaluated by by the staff and all the institutions in the system. So now I'm going to turn to Donna's question. Uh, thank you for putting it in the chat. I'm sorry about your tech issues. Um, uh, is Charter Oak grouped with universities or grouped with community colleges if 5% tuition increase is implemented in June? Um, the uh, Charter Oak, um, uh, I think, um, Charter Oak has not increased tuition so far, so their tuition remains flat. We have not taken any action. Uh, I believe that Charter Oak um, uh, is evaluating whether they could increase tuition for the fall. Uh, they Charter Oak is um, uh, because it's in the, an online institution that is in very direct competition with. Um, I'm not even going to say the names. I don't want you guys looking them up and thinking about. Me. I mean, there are. I mean, we all know it's you know Southern New Hampshire and and Phoenix and and uh, Arizona State. There are a bunch of big na Western governors. There are a bunch of big national and regional um, online institutions which are direct competition. And so, um, because of that, we are very mindful that uh, we cannot. Um, 
you know, if we're $500 more expensive than Southern New Hampshire, we will lose tuition because of that. I mean, that, you know, that there are, they, those are fully accredited, uh, good institutions with, with offerings that are, uh, are not unlike the offerings that we provide at Charter Oak and we're in competition with them. We think we provide a better product. We think our faculty is excellent and we think our, uh, our services and student support services and the fact that we're, you know, here in the state uh, uh, adds real value to people, but um, uh, that's not, uh, we don't, you know, we, we know that there's a lot of price sensitivity in the online education market. So I think that uh, uh, Charter Oak um, uh, might prefer not to raise tuition uh, and to seek to uh, make up additional revenue through enrollment initiatives. Uh, 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 and they're currently evaluating that. The numbers that we have here do not include uh, tuition increases at Charter Oak. Although I got to tell you, Charter Oak, because it's just such a smaller institution than the others, um, the amount that it would raise uh, um, from uh, tuition increases would would barely change the, I mean, you know, the, the universities can raise, you know, with 5% increase, they raise, uh, you know, $25 million or $24 million, something like that. The, um, you know, 5% increase at Charter Oak would not produce nearly that, that dollar, the, the, the same level of dollars. Uh, at this point, I think they're taking a look and trying to evaluate. I will say that the, but the governor's budget and the appropriations budget was very hard on Charter Oak. Uh, Charter Oak has, um, uh, uh, is, is, is going to be extremely challenged. Uh, however, um, you know, we may, uh, because it's a much smaller institution, the board of regents has some flexibility to, uh, uh shift resources to ensure that Charter Oak is able to continue to stay, uh, uh, you know, provide a, a full range of, 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 of courses. I know there's a lot of support for Charter Oak's mission, and we think that they're a valuable part of our system. So, uh, I don't believe that you're likely to see 5% increases at Charter Oak simply because we think that the, the loss of enrollment that would come from that uh, is, um, is so great that it would offset the, the increase. Uh, and that's a, a reflection of it being an online institution. Um, and you're absolutely right. Their enrollment is up. But I would point out, and I'm, you know, here I'm going to be a little bit of a booster. Enrollment is up everywhere. Enrollment this spring at the community colleges was up 3%. And the first time student enrollment this fall at the universities was up overall, not hugely, but up. Uh, and especially up at Central and Southern, which are, you know, our biggest institutions and the ones that have, um, uh, you know, the ones that were, uh, uh, I think, suffered some of the, some of the uh, biggest drops just because of their size. So we have seen, you know, there is positive signs in enrollment. You know, the, the pandemic has, significantly ended and a lot of a lot of students are you know coming back to their higher education so we uh um you know i, I that's the direction we want to be moving we want to be moving in in you know in, in ways to keep prices keep our institutions affordable keep our offering strong and grow enrollment that would be that's the best outcome for uh for the system and the one that the, the approach we want to take toward solving our financial problems uh over a over a period of time uh, anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah, I was going to say, I think, I think we're good for now. Um, but I will just say, Ben, um, thank you so much as, as always, you know, um, <laughs> I feel like every time you come in, I know, you, I know you talk about, um, you know, sounding pessimistic and everything, but again, you know, it's, we also need to be realistic and understand um, the outcome. So um, I think all the information is extremely helpful and it only helps um, just understand the issue more because it is more complicated than, um, than, than it seems at first. So, but. Yes, it's but it's not, it's, not um, it's, I, I, I appreciate your remarks and I, I will have to say that, um, the SAC is of all the groups I have to speak to about budget matters. My favorite. I'd rather, uh, I'd rather uh, spend my time educating you than uh, than almost any of the other constituencies in the system. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm sorry that I don't have better news. Uh, I hope I can return to speak to you in the fall uh, and uh, talk to you about how uh, uh, how we dodged a bullet and we're 
on track to, to, you know, get stronger and stronger. I, it, it, that's my fervent hope and you should be confident that the entire board and leadership of the system is, is, is doing everything in our power to make that happen. So, thank you very much and I hope you enjoy this beautiful summer weather for this afternoon. Yeah, you as well, Ben. And thank you for the words. We really appreciate it. Okay. Take care. Bye yeah, bye. have a good one. Um, and I don't know if there were any concerns, questions um, about anything we discussed as well. So I just want to make sure just space for that. And I know also um, Angela put in the chat, but I just also want to say if you do have like a final or anything that any other obligation, because I know it's the last week um, for a lot of people, you know, don't feel don't feel forced to stay. Um, Venetia, did you have a question? Hi, Alex. Um, Hi. Just a question. So I know a lot of people are getting together and walking to the Capitol on the 17th. I don't know if I'm not supposed to speak to everyone about it or not, but, you know, everyone's welcome, I suppose. Um, just to, you know, represent, um, you know, what we were just talking about, about the budget cuts and everything to sort of inform the, the you know, um, the governor and everyone else who's making decisions. Um, so I guess I'm sure all of the co community colleges and the, you know, uh, and um, everyone who's present here, I'm sure all of them are, you know, uh, getting together. So I think that would be a really great opportunity if, if, if you know, if anyone wants to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. I don't know. Um... If there's like, is do you know if there's like a, a flyer or like some type of like group of information for that or no? I don't. From Middlesex, okay. some of you know some of the uh, faculty I think is getting together. Uh, I know for a fact that a few weeks ago, a lot of you know a lot of community colleges and state universities got together. Uh, it would be nice. Uh, if all of us could also sort of go and represent our campuses and. Um, you know, all like we are the SAC, and if we could bring out, bring the information to our Senate and um, governing bodies, like student governors, um, you know, we should be able to sort something out. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Lena okay, so says, uh, she has flyers for the seventeenth, and maybe she could send them over to us. Yeah. Through Angelo. If that's okay, Angelo. Yeah, I, yeah, oh, right. that'd be great. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, so that that'd be great. If we if we have all the information, then we can definitely send it out to everyone, and then, um, you know, get get something going. But thank you for putting it on the radar. I appreciate it. Um, have moved anyone? Okay. Okay. Awesome. Toby, also thank you for that information. Um, also, I, just if you didn't see in the chat, um, until we put that the community colleges and students have moved to one holding pen. Um, so anyone who, everyone to come after um, education and CT now has a one stop shop. Ha, now has one stop shopping to make that happen. So that's awesome. Um, any other concerns or questions too before we close out? Or make sure I get everything. Okay. Well, no worries. Um, I do want to say. Um, I appreciate all the work we've done. I know that there were some goals we had that we didn't get to hit, um, but I think that with everything going on with the budget, I'm glad we were able to um, put a lot of focus on that because I think right now that's definitely definitely the bulk of bulk of the issue. Um, yeah, Donna, we're gonna we're gonna get that information out so everyone has that. Um, but yeah, uh, and I'm also I'm also graduating, so I won't be returning. Just want to let you guys know. Um, but I've put my email and I put my email again. Um, just feel free to reach out as we are in these closing weeks. Um, if you have any questions about anything S uh, SAC related and all that stuff. And also, if you just have any questions in general, just feel free to reach out. Um, but with that being said, I can take a motion to close the meeting at 11.10 a.m. If anyone would love to. First, first motion, man. First. Thank you. Wait, uh, can you just say your name? I'm sorry, just so I know. Oh, uh, Samuel Fagaquist from his Nuntuck. Thank you. And then a second. The final second. I will second it. Venetia. Awesome. Thank you so much, Venetia. Okay. All right. Well, we're all set. You all are free to go. Any questions? Let me know, though. Angela, thank you so much for your help as well. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations to all those graduating and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. You too.
Bye-bye. Your live stream has stopped and the recording has stopped as well.